series of teachings on the foundations of the Christian faith. That which we have as a basis of our understanding of Christianity. We find that, of course, as we've said in the previous videos in Hebrews, where it tells us that we will move on now, not laying again the foundation of the repentance from dead works of faith towards God, the doctrine of baptism and of laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do, if God permit. And so this is the uh, teaching that we would be doing concerning the resurrection of dead and the eternal judgments. And we remember that uh, in the beginning of uh, Jesus' ministry, uh, while he was here on earth, it wasn't long before the Sadducees came to him who did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And they asked him a question concerning the old Jewish law. Because underneath the, the Jewish law, that if a man died and left no children, then his brother would marry the woman and he would raise up an inheritance for that dead brother. And they asked him and said, there were seven brothers and one died and then the next one married the woman, the next one, and then the next one. Whose wife will this woman be in the resurrection? And Jesus said to them, you do not, you're an heir here. You're just an heir, and you don't know the scriptures, nor do you know the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry, nor are they given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. But uh, as touching the resurrection of the dead, haven't you read that which was spoken of by God? Where God said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For God is not the God of the dead, but he's the God of the living. And so Jesus Christ just simply did not argue about the resurrection. He just said that's what's going to happen when the resurrection comes. And so moving on in the life of Jesus Christ, we find that in Matthew chapter 17 and verses 2 and 3, that Jesus had taken his three of his disciples and they climbed the Mount of Transfiguration, is what it later was called after this event. And it says that as they were there together, he began to be white and he was transfigured before them. And his face, his face began to shine like the sun. And his clothing was whiter than any fuller could ever cleanse them. And then there, behold, there before him there appeared Moses and Elijah. And they were talking. Wow. So here was Moses and Elijah. And they had appeared and they were, they were talking to him. Remember that Jesus Christ, when he hung on the cross, one of the thieves said to him, Forgive me. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. So here we find again Jesus not questioning or saying anything about the resurrection other than just knowing that it was to be true. Jesus said in John chapter 11 and verse 25, he said to the woman, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believes in me, though he was dead, yet he shall now live. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is our resurrection. Isn't that amazing? John chapter 14 and verses 2 and 3 where Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and receive you unto myself. That where I am, you may be there also. Jesus Christ, the resurrection, the way, and the life, the one door, the one mediator through which we can touch God, which we know in the resurrection 
that he will already prepare a place for us, and we'll go and dwell there in paradise with him forever. We find after the first day of the week, after Jesus was crucified and placed in the grave, that uh, the, the women came to that graveside, and there was an angel there that appeared, and the angel answered and said unto the women in Matthew 28, verses 5 through 7, Don't be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has risen. And as he said, then, come, see where the Lord lay. Go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead. And so Christ was crucified, and on the third day he arose from the dead. He made a statement forever that he truly was the resurrection and the light. Matthew uh, chapter 27 and verse 52, it tells us that during that time that the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which had slept arose. And they came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So the power of the resurrection even impacted the old saints who were there lying in the graves in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 1, verses 2 and 4, we find that Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, he through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments to the apostles who he had chosen, and to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them for forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom. So not only was Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead, but he continued to dwell on the face of this earth for 40 days after that, speaking to many, many people. At one time, even speaking to a crowd, it says of over five, 400 people. And so we can see that he is truly the resurrection and the life. Now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, we find where it is written, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning those who have died, or those who are asleep, that you would sorrow not, even as others do that have no hope. We have a hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that they which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord will not prevent those who are already asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So it's saying here, let's not be ignorant. There is a day coming when uh, Christ will ascend from heaven, there will be the trumpet of God that will blow and the world will hear. There will be the shout of angels. And Christ, every eye will see him, every, every, every knee will bow. And Christ will again at one time, at one point in history, the hour we know not of, shall return to us and he will descend from heaven. And it tells us here that, that with the voice of this archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise out of the graves. And we won't stop this. We'll, we'll be here, it says. And then they which remain, or those of us that are still alive, we will be caught up with them, it tells us, into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. In other words, don't be discouraged, don't be dismayed, don't be sad and cast down today, for we have a living hope, and the day will soon be here, perhaps today, when Christ shall return, and we'll be with them forever in glory, for there truly is a resurrection of the dead. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 to 44, we find where it reads, so also is a resurrection of the dead. You and I, it said, it is sown in corruption. 
It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown as a natural body. It is raised as a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Verses 49 through 53 tells us, as we have borne the image of the earthly, as we have borne this body we're in now, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I would say, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The body that we now dwell in, this man you see here today, I cannot inherit the kingdom of God, and neither can you. Behold, I will show you a mystery. Neither corruption cannot inherit incorruption. But we will not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at that last trumpet, for that trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Oh, it tells us in Hebrews 9.27, wow, on that day, it said it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So not only do we know that each one of us, as it tells us, is like a vapor on the sea of time, we are here in such a short season, like a flower in the field, and we grow up and we quickly pass away in the timing of God Almighty. But for a moment, you and I dwell in this mortal body. But we have the hope and the knowing of the resurrection which Jesus Christ has already done. He who has said he's preparing a place for us and shall return and will be with him forever in glory. We live knowing of this hope, living for that day. Hallelujah. But now it's telling us on that day, on that day of the resurrection of the dead. It has been appointed not only that we would die and we would be sown in corruption and raised in incorruption, but it also tells us here that at that time of the resurrection, at that trump of God, it said there will be a judgment of all men. There will be a judgment at the time of the resurrection. In Revelation chapter 20 and Verses 11 through 15. It said, But I saw a white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose faith the earth and the heavens fled away. There will be a new heavens and a new earth. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books, notice it's a plural, the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to his works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You see, in that great day, it tells us there is a book that will be open. There was another book open, which was a book of life. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come up to the Father but by me. Those who have received Christ, those of us who have been born again, those who have tasted of the kingdom of God and have served God in his kingdom here on earth, when we receive Christ, we say, oh God, forgive me. Forgive me, almighty God, for I have sinned and I'm not worthy of your kingdom. My God, I need the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that sinless life 
the blood that was shed. Oh God, I ask you to forgive me. Let me turn from my wicked ways. I receive you, Jesus Christ, as my Savior. It says at that time, our names are written in this book of life. And on that day of the resurrection, when this world has ended, you and I will stand. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. No matter who you're thinking in your mind, the Pope, Adolf Hitler, the President of the United States, the greatest king or queen that has ever ruled or reigned, each of us will stand there. One by one, we will stand before the throne of God. And in that book, the book of life, your name will either be there, it shall not be there. And during that moment, in that point of time in eternity, that decision you made concerning Jesus Christ is either opening the door into paradise for you, But it's a reason, it says, they will be cast into the lake of fire. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He's saying, yes, yes, pastor, uh, so there was a book of life there, but what were all those other books? Well, you see, there's the judgment of the white throne. And then they're thrown into the lake of fire, but the remaining people there will be the believers, those whose names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They will pass on from the great white throne judgment unto the second judgment, which is known as the Bema Seed of Jesus Christ. And so there is the judgment of the believer according to, uh, of, of the believer and unbeliever, I should say, of all men concerning the Book of Life. But after the book of life is read, and it says they will separate the sheep on the one side, the goats on the other, and those who are found in the Lamb's book of life, the sheep, they shall move on forward. They will take a step forward. But those that were found to be goats and did not receive Christ as their Savior, it says they shall be cast into the lake of fire. They are forever punished in that lake of fire. There is no second chance in eternity. There is no place in the Holy Scriptures where you get your second chance. There's no little pen where they punish you for a short season and you can pay somebody else to pray you out of that place. That's simply not in the Bible. You see, this is what I'm doing here is the Bible. Did you know I went to Mormons, Mormon missionaries? I said, is the Bible true? And the Mormon mission said, oh, it's completely true. The Baptists, the Lutheran, all kinds of preachers. True priest. Is the Bible true? He said, yes, it's completely true. You see, when I'm speaking to you, I'm not taking these things out of a religion. This is not coming from a denomination. This is coming from the Bible. I'm quoting scriptures from the Holy Scriptures. There's nothing here political right now. There's nothing political here between you and me. I have no motive for telling you these things. I'm not going to ask you for a donation or send me any money. I'm here as Christ today, saying, Behold, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. There is a day when you will answer that question. What did I do with Jesus Christ? And those that received him it says that they take a step forward, and now there is Christ. And we're now appearing before the judgment seat of Christ. And for 2 Corinthians 5.10, that everyone might receive the things done in his body, according to that which he's done, whether it was good or bad. You see, we will be judged for what we did with our Christianity. Jesus told the parable of the, of the, of the talents. Some were given five, some two, some one, on and on. But the one who hid that talent, the one who did nothing with it, it said, Jesus said, take what he does have and give it to the man who did something with the talents. The parable of the virgins, some were wise and some were foolish. Okay? Jesus spent far more time teaching 
about your responsibility concerning the gospel than he ever did concerning you forsaking your sin. But this is a kingdom you've been born into. And this kingdom will move forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 11, where it tells us, No other foundation can a man lay than that which has been laid, Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds upon this foundation gold or silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work will be fully known. For the day will declare it. And because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire will test every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work remains, which he has done, then he will receive a reward. If any man's work will be burned, he will suffer loss, but himself shall be saved. Yet so is by fire. You see, there is a day where we will give account for ourselves. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 36, we find when Jesus was ministering and teaching among the people, he said, but I would say to you that every idle word that men will speak, they are going to give an account of that word on the day of judgment. Every word I'm speaking, I'll stand before Christ, before Jesus, and he'll say, why did you say that? That was an idle word. Those things will be, okay? They're passing through the fire. The good news is that Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 42, and whosoever would give a drink unto one of these little ones, a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, truly I'd say to you, he shall not lose his reward. The tiniest thing that we will do in the name of Christ, the smallest of things we might do in kindness unto somebody else in the name of his disciple. Jesus said, you won't lose a reward. Everything is being taken care of. Everything's being written down. Well, in Malachi chapter 3, and verses 16 and 17, oh, I love this. It said, those that feared the Lord, they spoke often one to another. And the Lord hearkened. He noticed, and he heard it. And it said, a book of remembrance was written before him for those that feared the Lord and that thought, that even thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. Isn't that amazing? Every thought that you and I think concerning Christ, concerning the gospel, it's being written down. It's being written down. Every word is being written down. The tiniest of acts of kindness are being written down. This will be a day of great rejoicing. This will be a day when we will have the tears wiped away from our eyes. Where we will sit forever in the kingdom of God. And those things that went without being noticed, the pain we suffered, the rejection, the cruelty, the mockery, the afflictions, some of us even are alive. It tells us on that day, those tears will be gone. And we will be those forever in the kingdom of a living God. A high and holy God. A God, the Father of all mercies. A God of comfort. The God of peace. Oh, we'll reign there in heaven forever. There's only two people I found as I studied the New Testament that ever was in heaven. One was Jesus Christ, and the other was the Apostle Paul, who was taken up into the third heaven. It's interesting that Jesus Christ, the man on the cross, and the Apostle Paul, they didn't call it heaven. They both referred to it as paradise, a place of the greatest and most amazing things concerning every avenue of life. That's where we're going, those of us that are in Jesus Christ. Oh, let those that name that name depart from iniquity, that we might be there on that far off day. <clears throat> it tells us in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18, when Jesus Christ was uh, writing the letter to the seven churches, he wrote in verse 18, Now I will counsel you to buy from me gold that's been tested in the fire, that you might be rich, and white clothing that you might be clothed upon. 
and that the shame of your nakedness it will not appear. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you might see. Let's receive Jesus Christ and place upon ourselves that robes, oh God, that robe of white raiment that comes through the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Let us be rich. I've had so many people say to me in my life, oh, don't worry about money. You can't take it with you. I'm sorry, but that's simply a lie. My Bible tells me I can take my money with me. Every cup of cold water I've ever given in the name of a disciple, I will be rewarded for. Every dollar I've ever spent and purchased a holy Bible and gave it to someone in a far off land, that money will be there too. There will be silver and gold in heaven. It will be the rewards of our faith and our righteousness. And that which we spent our mammon on. We don't serve mammon, we serve God. But oh God, our mammon, day after day, day after year, we have taken our mammon and we've served the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And there is a day when we get to heaven. It tells us some of us will be there just ourselves, saved by fire. But it tells us that Jesus is saying, now, uh, would, you, uh, uh, would you like to be rich? I'm counseling you. This is the words of Jesus. Revelation 3, I'm counseling you. Buy from me the gold that's been tested in the fire, the fire of your faith, that you might be rich. Hallelujah. White raiment, that you'll be fully clothed there. You see, we have a destiny. We have a calling. We can no longer stand by the side of the road. We can no longer rest with our talent. But you and I must raise up by our faith. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching them, baptizing them in all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And lo, I am with you always, Jesus says, until the end of the age. Oh, Matthew 24, 14 tells us, And this gospel of the kingdom, it shall be preached in all the world, for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Oh, glory, there is still nations that need to be reached for Jesus Christ. There is still a resurrection that needs to be proclaimed. There is a judgment that's coming. There is a God in heaven who's saying to you and I, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Take these foundations, these realities of Christ. Let's not build castles in the sand. Let's not enter into dead works. Let's not seek to build a building or to sing it or to do this or to do that or to do that. But let us understand there is one calling and one calling only for us to meet this resurrection without a guilty conscience. Jesus Christ said, now take up your cross. He is not willing to forsake everything and be my disciple. He's not worthy of me. This is a day. Take up the cross. Take up the cross. This isn't an easy life. This is, we're called to the cross. We're called to be that servant that's reaching out. Who will go? Who will take this message to the ends of the world? Are we doing everything for God? Do we love God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul and all of our strength? That's the question. There's not one person that's ever lived that will not stand. As I'm looking into this camera, so we will stand and look into the face of Christ. And he will say, did you love me? For he that loved me kept my commandments. He that loved me took the talent, answered my calling, took up his cross, and he went into all this world preaching this message of the resurrection power, the saving grace, and the coming kingdom of God in the resurrection of the dead. This is the foundations of the Christian faith. I give you a charge now. Let this be the foundations, not only of the Christian faith. Let it be the foundations that you and I walk on, that we live in, that we pattern our lives around, 
that we give ourselves to completely. Let us follow on to know this high and holy living God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray. O oh God, this day we bow our head. Grant us to feel the responsibility. Grant us to feel the conviction, God, to be holy. Let us understand there's nothing holding us back for you set an open door before us to go everywhere preaching the gospel. And, O oh God, grant us the Holy Ghost. Grant us a revelation of this joy surpassing anything we might know or imagine this moment, of being there, standing before you, Lord Jesus Christ, and hearing those words, enter in, good and faithful servant. Let us run this race with patience, with determination, and with faith, calling unto you, eternal God, the God of the impossible, and let us be the one that takes this message to this next village, to this next nation, to this next lost person. And let us never rest, O oh God, until we too pass from this life. But let us die in Christ, carrying a cross, proclaiming to the nations, Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Heavenly Father. And for these things, eternal God, we commit ourselves. We pray for mercy, grace, kindness, and protection all of our remaining days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go in peace, go in a purpose, and go in the power. Love you guys. See you next time. Amen.